going to talk about doing dependency injection using Dagger 2. Um, I have a lot of sample code out there. Um, I'll, I'll put a link to the presentation, which has a link to this um, on the event site after the presentation. Um, so first, I've got some questions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the background of what dependency injection is. It's kind of an awkward concept if you've never been introduced to it. Um, we'll talk about how to use Dagger 2 um, and then some resources that I found that have been particularly useful and then we'll have questions. Uh, with, so with that said, who has heard of dependency injection before? Okay, so about half. Um, who has used a dependency injection framework before? Whether it be Dagger, Juice, Spring, something in another language? Okay, about a third, less. Um, Who's heard of Dagger? Other than the presenta presentation topic. Okay, about a third or half. Um, and who has used Dagger and deployed it into a, into a production application? Okay, about four or five, cool. Um, who likes GIFs? So we're gonna make this fun. So here's the background for dependency injection, and this is kind of going to like a computer science theory uh, area. So I'm not going to read this paragraph just because it's computer science-y and I didn't sleep a lot this week and it would just go right over my head. So like Captain Reynolds, um, yeah. There's, I'll give you a second to read it, but it's hard to follow. A much better definition, in my opinion, is this. Dependency injection means giving an object its instance variables. Really, that's it. It doesn't go beyond that. It is as simple as that. Um, this quote was from like 10 years ago. Um, absolutely still relevant today. Um, and it's easy to kind of understand this, but then it gets tricky to apply sometimes. So we'll help out with that tonight. So let's try to create like a mental model around this. Um, so we have a class, our box, and the box has variables that it needs to have inside of it. Uh, we'll call our box a main activity, and um, this, it's gonna need a location manager. Um, it might have a reference to an application where it gets something off that value. Uh, it may have a cache that it accesses. Uh, it may be tied into some type of event bus. Um, pretty normal stuff. Um, this demo application that we're going to look at later kind of follows a lot of this. Um, so the normal way you would write this is your class is going to go with these tentacles and reach out all over your application and grab what it needs. A you know, little scary. Um, you might call, you know, get application and cast it to your type to get a reference to that guy. Um, you might call your know, context that get system service to get the location manager. Um, you might, you know, get the bus off a of singleton, and um, your cache may be in some <coughs> static value. And if you're doing that, um, God kills a kitten every time you use a static. So don't do that. Um, so what is dependency injection? Uh, Dagger comes along and cuts off all the tentacles. Um, you are now responsible, for, or someone else is now responsible for giving the box the things that belongs inside the box. Does that kind of make sense? Um, something to note here is, even though we've cut off the tentacles, we've now added another player to the mix, so things just got a little more complicated. Um, remember that. Um, so dependency injection is just a generic software pattern. It's not something proprietary, not something that a vendor can sell you. It's just a way of structuring your application. Um, it's not new. It's, you know, the quote that I showed you had been around for the better part of a decade, and the concept has been around longer than that. Um, obviously, because of the Wikipedia entry, it was very computer science-y. If you like uh, the solid software design principles, um, it complements that really well. Dependency injection is not the D in that. Um, that's dependency inversion, different thing. Um, this isn't unique to Android either. It's 
whether it doesn't matter what kind of framework or platform or language you're in, you're going to encounter this type of pattern and the tools around it. Um, if you've done a lot of Java stuff, especially like Java EE, you know, you'll either encounter it with uh, Spring and their way of you know doing dependency injection, or I think the newer way is with context dependency injection, where your app server manages it. But it's not new, not unique. Um, so why do people do dependency injection? So this chart is not entirely to scale. <coughs> Mostly for testing. Um, you know, sometimes you can get more modular code out of it, and sometimes you can you know, put your application to like different configuration with it. Um, sometimes you just do it because everyone else is doing it, and it looks cool. Um, please don't do that. Um, it's while it's not wrong, it's kind of like being in line at uh, a drive-through and you're paying for the person behind you. It's you're not going to get any benefit out of it other than building good karma. So, if you're billing someone to do work and you're not getting value out of it, yeah. Um, so, given that slide, um, with testing being the really big wedge, uh, surprise! This is really a talk on how you can create more testable applications. Who knew that was coming? Okay, about well, four, four or five. Um, so over the last 10 years or so, these are things that I've either heard, read, maybe even have said and learned differently um, about dependency injection. Um, you can't test without it. Um, I call BS. Everyone has thumbs and screens require thumbs and you can do testing. Um, it makes some types of testing incredibly easy. Uh, we'll look at that when we start looking at the sample project and how we would have otherwise had a very hard time testing out something, but dependency injection can help make that easy. Um, I've heard that you have to rewrite your app. No, um, don't do this. You can slowly introduce it over time with or without tools um, or with or without libraries. It's pretty, you can do it slowly, gracefully, um, where it makes sense. You don't have to go all in on it. Um, as with all tools, it's, it'll solve your problems. Uh, no, um, with this being a testing talk and with, de with dependency injection helping and facilitating testing, if you're not doing automated testing, um, you're never changing out implementations or never planning on getting reuse, you're not going to get a whole lot of value out of it. So. Um, as you're structuring things and deciding what to adopt and how to plan things out, you know, just do basic developer economics. You know, if you're not going to use it, then don't introduce the complexity that comes with it. So, what is Dagger? Um, Dagger is a tool to help with dependency injection. Um, there's a JSR with a bunch of Java standard annotations for how to do dependency injection. It follows all of those and all of the recommendations. And uh, so, when someone comes into your application, if they've done big Java EE apps, you know they shouldn't be terribly surprised with what they're seeing and how things are structured. So it should be familiar. Um, Dagger two is unique from other dependency injection frameworks like Dagger one and uh, Juice and Spring, and that during when your application is compiling, they've got a processor that'll go over everything, figure out what goes where, um, and generates all of the code to make that happen. No reflection. So if it builds, it will almost certainly work. Um, that's a pretty cool thing to be able to go into a project and have that type of assurance. Um, with that said, you know, with it all being static, um, there's almost a zero, zero, you know, uh, runtime performance hit for doing dependency injection, just because it ends up being just a few instructions to figure out what goes where. And so that's pretty cool. Um, well, this will make sense in a second when we jump into the code. But there's three kind of moving pieces when you're doing dependency injection with Dagger. You've obviously got the class, our box, that needs to have things put inside of it, the shapes. There's going to be a component that the class talks to that says, hey, I'm interested in getting these types of things. 
And then you're going to have this thing called a module, which is basically just a bunch of simple factory methods that says, you know, I need a uh, cache, return new cache. I need a location manager, and it'll be the one that does the context get that gets system service, you know, location manager or location service. Um, it takes those details where you would have done it normally instead of reactivity and puts them somewhere else. And that's important later for testing. We'll, we'll see why. Um, so the previous slide was kind of misleading um, because of the way that it does the compile time generation of, you know, figuring out how to get of your application plumbing. You end up with this other thing below called your application component or your component is an interface and it generates a concrete implementation of that interface that then you use. Um, they always prefix it with dagger, so, um, and it'll live in the mysterious generated folder. Um, it's not terribly scary code to look at. You know, the first time you, you know, try to figure out you know, how things are getting wired up, it might take 30 minutes and then after that you're like, oh, okay, this is, I get it. Um, the code that it generates is actually for it being compiler generated code or generated code is pretty readable um, and pretty efficient too, which is important with the 64,000 method limit thing that we all hit. So um, some of the, you know, I mentioned the JSR annotations that trigger all of the stuff, you know, your class or box is going to have things marked with at inject. It says, I need this, you know, someone had better be able to give it to me. Um, your component is what triggers the annotation processor to say, hey, I'm going to you know, generate a concrete implementation of this component. And then your module, you know, you have to declare it as a module so it knows what can go where. And then it, you know, tells you which things it can provide. This will all make sense when we start looking at code. Do we have any questions so far? Yes. Yes, it's definitely a preprocessor. Um, yep. So with Java 6 or Java 5, they introduced, I can't remember which one, Java 5. Um, as part of Java C, you can do annotation processing before the actual uh, comp compilation to generate uh, lots of very useful code. Um, there's a lot of libraries out there that can really improve your productivity with code generation, especially on Android. So it ties into that system. Any other questions? Is it kind of making sense? Okay, more head nods than I expected, cool. So let's look at code. Um, so we're going to look at a demo application. Um, it's going to display the current location, the latitude and longitude, and it's going to keep track of all the location events that it receives. So it can maybe do like a pathing or something later or all we're going to do is show the number of events that we've received. Given that application, because this is a, really a testing talk, there are some tests that we would like to be able to write around this. Um, one is if there's no location provider av available on your device. That, that could be kind of challenging to simulate. Um, if we never receive location updates, what does the application do? Okay. Um, we only receive one location update. We're getting better. Or if we receive multiple location updates, which is probably more of the real life scenario. Um, we would like to ensure that the application we're shipping, you know, behaves correctly under all these different scenarios. So those are the tests that we'll try to write around this. <laughs> so let's jump over to the code. Let me make this big. So the first thing is we're going to look at our Gradle file for how to bring this in. Can everyone see this? Cool. Um, this is all up on the sample project too, so you don't have to try to memorize this. Um, first thing is we're going to pull in a plugin to our build process that will actually do our uh, code generation and make it available to Android Studio. We're going to tell Gradle to Hey, kick up this plugin, you know, become aware of it, you know, activate it. 
the rest of it's all pretty normal stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then add in these three dependencies. You know, one of them is to pull in the dagger annotations. Uh, one of them is to pull in the code generation compiler that will not actually be packaged inside your application, but does all the fancy magic. And that's it. And then you hit radial sync, and it'll pull down a few jar files, and you're ready to rock and roll. Um, our application, let's run it. Looks about like this. Um, when there's no location events coming in, it just says, hello world. As soon as we turn on location updates, it starts updating. So it's keeping a list or of the location updates it receives. It displays our Latin long. So if we want to move really quickly, we'll change this to 80, get updates. So with that said, you know, there's a few different things we're doing here. Let's take a look at it. Let's make this a little bit bigger too. So it's just a regular standard Android activity. We're getting a reference to a location manager, just a regular Android location manager. Using the way you get access to the stuff, you just say, give me the system service. Um, setting a content view, setting a toolbar. Um, Whenever we come into on resume, we're basically registering ourselves to get location updates with any available provider. If there are no providers enabled, we're going to show a location that says no providers enabled. Even though I had turned off GPS in the emulator or simulator, Jenny Motion, um, we never actually got to this point. So that makes testing kind of interesting. Um, so even on a even a controlled environment, it's hard to recre recreate this scenario. But it happens in the wild, I promise you. So we've got a little bit of logic in here. You know, that would be interesting to put some tests around. Uh, when the activity shuts down, we clean ourselves up. Otherwise, we're in a leak. Don't do that. Um, whenever we do get location updates, we're going to reach out to the application because we've got a list of uh, locations that we're caching up there. Um, add the locations to that, and then we're going to update the message on the screen with the total number of location updates and where we're currently at, and then just a bunch of messages you have to implement, implement for the interface, and then the helper method. So not a super complex activity. You got a fragment in here that just basically shows a message, and then. Here's our list of locations that we're caching. So whenever your ap application goes away, it, you don't care about it, it's just they're gone. Does that call, kind of make sense? That was kind of a fast whirlwind tour through a simple application. So given all that, let's jump back. How would you go about testing that there's no location provider? Given that this is the way we all kind of write apps today, that is simple, straightforward. It's kind of a pain, isn't it? How would you test that you never receive location updates if your provider is enabled? Or you have like a GPS you know, provider, but you've, not today, but you have clear skies that, and you're talking happily to a satellite and it's streaming down lots of location updates. It's kind of a challenge. Um, you can kind of see where this is going. It's trying to write you know, assertions around this is not great. So let's see how we could refactor this. So a few slides ago, I kind of mentioned you've got your activity that needs to have things injected, your component, which kind of wires things up, and then the module, which actually does all the hard work. If you're going through and refactoring this to include for Dagger, I would kind of go the other way as you're building things out. Start with a module, and then go to the component, and then bring it back to the, where you're doing your injections. So let's refactor this out. So we're going to create a new Java class. We're going to call it app module. 
the first thing that we're going to pull out of our activity so we can do better testing is our location provider or location service. Um, to do that, we need a reference to a context. I mentioned we need to mark this as a module to help dagger out for compiled gener or code generation. When you type the annotation, does that automatically create the import? Yep. That's something you get with Android Studio. And then I mentioned we have to mark this with provides so it knows that this is something that can help dagger out. And Say it again. Does that automatic generation come within your uh, IDE that you're using? The automatic generation is provided through that Gradle plugin that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, this guy. He's the one that triggers all the generation and making things visible. <laughs> so then how do we do this in our activity? It was we're just gonna copy and paste this dude. That's all there is to a module. Let's create a component. So I mentioned earlier, this has to be an interface. We're going to mark it with component. And this component knows about the modules that can provide things that it can use to help other people out. So. We're going to do at module.class. You'll see where this comes in in just a second. And we know that our component is going to uh, provide dependencies into main activity. That's all there is for that. So at this point, if you try to reference what Dagger is going to generate, it doesn't exist yet. So build your project, and it'll start generating some of that stuff for you. Uh, let's see. We're going to come back to him in just a second. We built our module. We've associated it with component. Let's go back to main activity. So this is something we'd like to get rid of. Let's replace this with at inject, saying that this should be injected for us. And then we're going to do um, the generation or the thing that was generated for us, uh, dagger application app component. So now we're using generated code. Our component requires a reference to a module. We have to help it out a little bit. It can't figure it out all by itself. The module requires a context, and activity is a context. And then build. And what is it not like? and then we want to inject ourselves.
did not give us our location manager. So I'm going to cheat. And catch up with the code in the project. Oh, I should have done the component generation on the activity or on the application. So let's take a look at what that should have looked like. Uh, same type of thing again. We've got our component, building it up, giving it our module. It takes in a context. This guy, same type of thing, provides a location manager. And then the application talks, reaches out to the, the activity reaches out to the application and then requests injection. Other than that, all the code's the same. So let's run it. And this is why live coding is fun. There we go. So we're back up and back up and running. So let's take a look. So module component references the module and knows that it can uh, do stuff with an activity. And then our activity reaches out and says, "Hey, give me inject myself or you know satisfy my." the things I want injected. And then our application is the one that actually manages our component. Are we all complexity? Yes? It knows about those because when we created our component, We told it about all of the modules that that component should be aware of and needs to know about to satisfy its dependencies. Does that answer your question? Yep. Cool. So, say it again. Yeah, the, so the provider, this is what that annotation right there is what triggers Dagger to know that, hey, this method can provide something to satisfy someone else's needs. <coughs> Craig. Two dependencies of the same type. Let's come back to that later. Okay. Well, I've got it covered, but yeah. I've got it covered, but not right now. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> um, so with all of that said, we've introduced a bunch of new classes, harder to figure out where things are coming from. Um, let's try to see if we can go and write some tests around this. And because I am not trusting myself with live coding anymore. We're going to check out stuff. Uh, except there's, except there's. Cool. So who writes unit tests right now or any type of automated tests? Okay. Uh, seven or eight. Cool. So we'll try to step through this. Um, kind of going back to this, you know, there's four different scenarios that we'd like to make sure that our application behaves correctly in that are otherwise hard to simulate. So let's look at main activity test. Let's wait for Gradle to catch up. Um, who is familiar with JUnit at least or has heard of it? 
J unit. Okay, a few more. So J unit is a Java library that makes automated testing of applications um, pretty straightforward and easy. It's been around, I think, probably about as long as I've been doing Java, maybe longer. Um, Yeah, it's probably closer to 15. So what it is, is it's just a regular Java class, and you're writing instructions to basically say, you know, given all of these, you know, set of conditions, uh, when I do something, I expect that the application is going to be in this state, or that some behavior is invoked. So we've got a class. We're going to be testing out main activity. Um, we've got a method that we're going to, you know, use for testing when there's no providers available. You know, we annotate it with at test. It's just a regular JUnit annotation that says, hey, this is a method that, you know, as you're going through and, you know, running things, this is something that you should be running. So there's a few different things going on here. Um, if you have been doing Android testing before and you've used activity Activity test case two and extending things off that, um, those are kind of going away in favor of having activity test rules. Um, and it's just basically, you still have to give it, you know, the class that you want to run, at, but then you get a little bit more control over how your application is started and when. And, um, so this is actually going to create a new instance of our activity for every test. We're going to be mocking out a location manager to send into our activity. So we went through all of this work to basically, you know, let you know, cut off the tentacle inside of our application that says, you know, you're not going to go reach out to grab location manager. You know, someone else is going to give it to you. This is where we're going to start seeing those benefits. We realized there's a newer library called DaggerMock that I was playing with that seems to actually work pretty well. Um, I'm not going to pretend I completely understand all of this yet. Um, but it lets you override the modules that you would otherwise provide for your component for test cases. So in this case, it knows that we're going to be mocking out a location manager just from the way it's running. It's going to grab all of those and then set those on the application as the component, as the component that we're going to ask for to say, give me injections. It's kind of like a bait and switch. So again, lots of complexity. They said better pay off. So when our mock location manager asks for all of our providers, let's jump back to our activity code. I'm actually going to split this up. Maybe not. So when we ask for all of our providers, we're going to iterate all over all those. Um, if we don't have any providers, and when we launch our activity, we expect a message on our screen that says no location providers are enabled. This was going to be the thing that was going to be really difficult to test because we couldn't even really do it in Jenny motion, but it's just something we need to handle in the wild. Um, we're going to have another test that says when we do have providers, you know, give me a uh, give me a provider called test. It's we're create we're going to you know create behavior that doesn't exist currently because we're doing a bait and switch with our location manager. And then we're going to say, hey, if someone asks, is the test provider enabled, return true. <coughs> sure. We can, we're setting the rules. Launch the activity and then make sure that our you know, screen is, you know, shows a message that says waiting for location. Um, that was going to be another kind of difficult thing to test out. And then, you know, the tests go on, you know, if we have a test provider and it's enabled and, you know, someone says, uh, request location updates, we want to immediately fire a new location with a uh, flat and long and uh, ugly mock keto code to make it happen. But either way, we're driving our application now. Um, and we expect the message to say the total location updates are one year now at whatever Latin law we specified. So we can put ourselves wherever we want in the world, which is kind of a hard or potentially expensive thing to simulate too. There's all this kind of lots of complexity, hopefully lots of value. Um, 
So let's run this real quick, just so. And I'm going to jump over to Jenny Motion real quick. And you're going to have to watch really closely because it's going to go by really fast. And it doesn't matter if I toggle the GPS on or off because we're not using the real GPS. We're using the, our location manager as part of our tests. Cool. So that took a total of one second, almost two seconds to run to verify all these otherwise pain in the butt scenarios to test. If I was doing this manually, other than validating that the phone was in Antarctica, um, it could have taken 10 minutes, hopefully. Um, questionable if I could reproduce it over and over. Um, you could see how this scales for larger applications. Um, so we've traded adding a little bit of complexity to our application for being able to verify its correctness repeatedly faster. Um, I don't know how I would have otherwise simulated, you know, different location updates and behaviors um, with the tentacle code. So it's a, in my opinion, a fair trade. Any questions so far? I saw, I thought I saw one hand go up earlier. Kind of makes sense. This is a, you know, a lot of stuff. It's kind of a fire hose, so cool. Um, and again, all this code is up on GitHub, same place. Um, so this one, <coughs> excuse me, I'll talk about some of my recommendations and things I found just using it. Um, you don't have to necessarily memorize this or completely get it, but if you're, you know, three months into using it and you're like, as, you know, Greg alluded to, how do you do different types, you know, hopefully this just kind of remembers, oh yeah, you know, he talked about this. So um, just kind of like listening for keywords. Um, if you're worried about the 64,000, you know, method limit, as we all are on Android, um, you've probably got, Dagger's not going to be the source of your pain. The code it generates is actually pretty light. Um, it's efficient. Um, I've seen some other code generators that generate just tons of stuff. And, you know, while they're useful, I ended up having to rip them out just because I didn't want to fight this battle. Um, one way you can help, you know, help Dagger out is if you have an object and it takes in, you know, a handful of arguments to create it. You can mark its constructor with that inject and Dagger works some magic and it figures out what goes where. Um, it seems super helpful until you have to figure out where this thing is coming from and who's injecting it and with what values. Um, I would recommend if, if it's something that you're putting onto your you know, component graph that you're you know, then injecting, just manually build it up yourself. Don't use the fancy inject magic. Um, it'll make your system or your code a little easier to follow for someone else later. Um, if you create a component, um, whether it be in your application or activity or fragment, and you can create components in all of them, um, keep a reference to it because you'll probably need it later. You know, if you're, if you're creating a component inside your activity, your fragment's going to need it later, so keep a reference to it. Um, So with that said, because you can create components in all kinds of different places, you know, these are the places I found that are the, kind of the best place to do it. Um, obviously, you're almost certainly going to have an component that lives in your application. That's going to effectively be a singleton. Um, you know, do it immediately after you set up your crash reporter and then call you know, super on create um, or after that. If you're creating it in your activity, um, do it right before super on create. You know, lint might throw a warning, but ignore it. Um, it. You do it beforehand because if you're extending off a base class and your base class needs something injected, and it's it creates chaos. Just do it beforehand. If you're doing it a fragment, um, and hopefully this is a rare use case, um, I've got it in a few different places just because I've got some ugly big fragments that I don't like, but um, just use normal fragment activity communication. You know, let your activity be the one who satisfies all the dependencies. So get a, keep a reference to your activity and the fragments on attach. Um, and on activity created at that point, then you can call up to the activity and say, hey, satisfy all my stuff. Um, I've got an example of that in the 
sample code. So, and because fragments are weird, and depending on where you're using them, view pagers, uh, you may have to adjust that, tweak it accordingly. Fragments are weird. That's all I could say. If you like have an activity, you're going to have an on create method, and your on create method has to delegate or call down into you know the base class. Uh, create your component before that. So like, where would I do that? You would do it. Okay. But still on create. Yep. So and even in this case, you know, we're reaching out, we're getting the our app component, we're injecting everything before. We call this, and that makes sure that you know this class and all the classes below it are all set up before it starts going through its on its setup logic. Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. And again, fragments are weird. I can't reiterate that enough. Um, if you have multiple components and they have dependencies on each other. Um, you can explicitly specify the dependencies um, on a component tag. Let's take a look at that, what that looks like. Where we specify our modules, it has another thing where you can specify dependencies that references other components. Um, you can also do uh, subcomponents. Um, and again, this makes sense if you have an application component and an activity component that references that. And, Maybe things farther down. Uh, I find it cleaner to use subcomponents. Um, you have to maintain less code just because they're already aware of each other and wiring just happens. And the long version short, less code. Uh, Greg's question earlier of you know what happens if you need to provide multiple values of the same type? It would seem intuitive, but Dagger uses types to figure out what things go where, and um, you can mark a value with at named, and that kind of qualifies it. It's the type plus this name. Um, so where that would make sense is, let's open up our module. We're providing locations. Uh, whatever. Um, so if you have the same type, but for different purposes, like maybe a LRU cache versus uh, in-memory cache or something, or disk cache, you know. You might want to have different behaviors based on those, but they have the same interface, so. Um, that'll help Dagger figure out where things go. And if you need to limit what things, what dependencies can go where, um, there's this concept of scoping that you can use. Um, it takes a little bit to kind of wrap your head around, so. Uh, like your, Activity, the things in your activity component probably shouldn't bleed up to your um, application component, so you want to keep those scoped differently. Um, by default, yeah, we'll just leave it like that. They're tricky. Um, so again, this being a testing talk, there's a handful of different ways that you can set up your tests. Um, up until recently, uh, build variants were kind of an ugly, hackish way to provide different implementations. They were kind of a pain in the butt to maintain, and especially up until recent tooling changes where they made tests and automated, or unit tests and integration tests and all building at the same time um, in Android Studio. So I don't, I think we're going to steer away from that one, just kind of internally. Um, you can call, I'm going to qualify this one. We look at our code and we are setting a test component as, or a test component implementation as part of our test cases. Um, that seems to be kind of the generally accepted best way of doing things right now using Dagger 2. Um, there's a, a blog post on Square Island, where they, actually a handful of them where they talk about you know, different approaches to doing this. That you know, goes over it in a lot better detail than I could explain. Um, you can set up a custom test runner that runs a special version of your test application so you don't have to have a set component method. Um, that's kind of nice because 
then you're not introducing test code into a production application. Um, or, yeah. Or the library we looked at earlier, like Dagger Mock, where it just kind of figures out how to wire things up differently. Um, this is kind of the, it's, I heard about it a few weeks ago. It seems to be very promising. So uh, definitely follow that one. And if you've structured your application to support dependency injection and you're using Dagger 2, um, but you're kind of hitting the upper balance of what you'd like to do with it, um, take a look at Dagger 1. Um, they don't generate all the wiring code for you um, at compile time. You know, they still resolve a little bit of it at runtime, which gives you a little more uh, flexibility in terms of being able to override what gets provided where. Um, it's not going to be a big refactor, so it could be worth exploring. But um, I kind of lean towards Dagger 2 over Dagger 1, just because if I build it, I want to know what's going to run. So uh, I've got a bunch of resources. Um, it was a little over a year ago when they actually announced Dagger 2 and kind of their motivation and the design that they had behind it. It's a 40-minute video, uh, actually pretty interesting. You know, they talk about how they want to differentiate with from other dependency injection frameworks. The website has lots of really, well, it's the full documentation and it's pretty readable. Um, their sample code or you know sample scenarios are harder to directly apply to like real world stuff. So hopefully my sample project helps with that. Um, I mentioned Square Island uh, has a really good set of uh, posts on uh, Dagger 2 and doing it with testing and Espresso. Uh, she actually presented at the Big Android Barbecue earlier this summer and that video should be up on YouTube too. And it's another really good one. And Caster.io has a lot of great training videos on Dagger 2. You know, there's you know, things you have to pay for, but it's you know, well worth the money just because it gets you there faster. Um, and again, tentacle code, so. Any questions? Ben? How so many, where do you draw the boundaries between components? Do you wind up with one great big component that knows how to inject everything? Do you have one for activities and one for application and one for fragments, or are there, do you wind up with lots of components floating around the application? I, most projects generally start with um, just an application component uh, because you know that's usually you know you're trying to pull things out where you're dependent on Android for testing you know like a location manager you know things that are otherwise hard to change behavior for. If you get into other patterns like model view presenter or things like that, you know then activity components make a little more sense. Um, that gets a little trickier to use with Espresso just because of where you have to override the component sure. setup and. So one big component isn't an anti-pattern, it's, no. it's where you start. Yep. Okay. Um, the, I could show you the component, application component for the project I'm working on right now, mm -hmm. and it's big and long, but I'm being opportunistic about introducing activity components where it makes sense and I can put tests around things. And, yeah, and so it's- Same question with modules to some degree. How, how focused do you keep your modules just from the if it's something where I'm trying to pull those dependencies out and they're dependent upon Android specifically, mm -hmm. I'll put those in something called Android module. Um, if they're things that are more application specific, I'll create like an app module. Okay. Um, if they're things that are dependent for an activity, I'll create you know, an act, you know, main activity module or something like that that's specific to, towards that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try to you know, keep those in the same package structure as the other, you know, tight affinity to where they are being used. Okay. So all of the above. It's earlier this year, uh, they got out of beta and it's, it's live, it's production. It's, okay. yeah. Um, they've only had a few bugs, so they've, you know, version 202 or something. It, it does what it needs and it does it without any issue. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was interesting to follow it then, um, but I couldn't quite pull the trigger and, uh, Dagger one didn't quite meet the needs I was looking for for an application, so yeah, I was very happy to, when they said, "Okay, we're out of beta." Where it's so yeah, it's uh, not beta anymore. It's it's live. It's real. It's production. 
Um, any other questions? Is it, I know it's a fire hose and a lot of kind of abstract concepts. Does it make sense? I mean, it's introducing complexity, but you know, do you think that you would get value out of something like this? Okay, more ahead and up. Yes? The Wikipedia article has a really good explanation of dependency injection. Is that the same link that I had like on the third slide? That one? No, that wasn't the one I had in mind, but I'm curious to see my article. Okay. It's yeah, the good analogy of reaching for, looking for something neat in the fruit. I like that one. Uh, hmm. I'll look at that one later when I'm hungry. <laughs> So instead of me making my sandwich, I'm going to a restaurant. I like it. You know, Jason? You made a comment that in order to implement this, it's not necessary to basically refactor the entire thing. You can definitely introduce it slowly into an existing application. Yep. What's the best way to do that on a from I maintain a very large application that I did not write. Yep. As you're adding in tests and you find that things are difficult to test because your code is reaching out and grabbing other things that you don't necessarily have control over. Um, and I think that, All the code does, it out. yeah, well, and, well, you know, that's not unusual either. Right. And it's not necessarily, you know, terrible. It's, you know, easy, it's, it's straightforward to read, but then trying to accomplish other things like having automated tests becomes more challenging. Um, these are the kind of the smells that I can, you know, pick up whenever uh, I know that things are going to be harder to test. You know, anything that touches context is just, you're going to be sort of in for a world of hurt. Um, so try to, you know, pull yourself away from that. Uh, singletons, uh, things that reach out to an application to get something specific. Um, and anything that involves static is just, uh, And it's just, yeah, it's just that's, a... That's what gives you the visibility and the IDE and the, and the uh, yep. automatic as, stuff like adding the import. Yep. As the compilation process happens, you know, this is what takes that generated code and makes it visible to Android Studio. I didn't quite catch that first time. Too. Thank you. Yep. How do you get up to add this uh, your application to your project here online? Say it again. That URL, like the sample code? Yeah. Yep. Well, it, uh, does this group have a GitHub? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, we might. It probably hasn't been touched in a few years. Besides Android, too. <laughs> we might. I'll have to go digging. Okay. If we don't, well, we could create one and fork things into that. Yeah. Well, I was searching for it, couldn't yep. find it. So. But yeah, just github.com slash Patrick Hammond and then probably the most active repository <coughs> last night or today or something. So, um, any other questions? No? Okay, cool. Thank you for feeling. <laughs> um,